Greetings, what is up and a very warm welcome to the channel The Sun is Shining and the Magpie is Casting. Coming to you guys right now with a live one versus one battle featuring spawning in the west. It's going to be the Overcommand West pieces of Bapu. And the spawning in the east, playing as the Soviet forces, it'll be CPSS Hazuki Watora. And the map here for our entertainment today is going to be Kolodny Farm. And so yeah. As these two players move on out and start capping around the map, um, let's talk about the action at the weekend, of which I only caught a little bit, but um, I watched the, um, so this is the World Championship, obviously, um, which AE has been hosting on him on his epic Twitch channel, um, and just, um, I was able to catch like two thirds of a series, um, busy weekend, but I got back late on Sunday, caught some of the games, watched Brosterus versus Von Ivan, so um, spoilers alert if you uh, don't want, don't want any spoilers about this event, and uh, I guess stop listening now. Go watch those games uh, on the Twitch or whatever, and then uh, and then come back because I'm about to start talking about them. So yeah, it was best of five elimination series because this is round of 32 in the World Championship tournament. Brosrus gets taken out by Von Ivan. I was so I got to admit I'm a little bit surprised about that. Uh, I think it was 3-2, and uh, close series, close games, but um, Von Ivan showcasing an, a fresh take on the United States Forces meta. Going for double WC-51 truck openings, <clears throat> and taking a few games, or at least two games off of uh, Brosterus this way. And it looks strong, to be honest. Yeah, so he's um, he opens up WC-51 commander, gets out the two trucks, micros them like a champ, keeps them both alive, and sort of snowballs the game from there, really. And... Uh, Honestly, it feels like of all the players I've been casting recently, I mean, I know casting ladder games randomly is a very different thing to playing a best of five series in a tournament. And just because you're very good on the ladder, that does not necessarily mean that you're going to be that 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 you're going to be that sort of that that, blah, 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 that that represents how good you'll be in a tournament setting. It's just very different. When you're playing in a tournament, you get to look at games, past games, videos that your opponent has played, because you know ahead of time who you'll be playing, often anyway. Um, so you can you can do some research on your opponent, um, and you know, you'll also have an idea of your opponent going in, and also playing a best of five is a completely different thing to playing a best of one, like absolutely completely different. There's a lot more room for back and forth, for interplay, for reading your opponent, for learning, adapting on the fly, and um, just a whole lot of skills that playing best of ones on the ladder will never will never will never test or stress or, or develop in a player. So yeah, it was very interesting to see the Brosterus, who for my money, basically just according to the videos I've caught on the channel, which is a very limited window and should not absolutely, it's definitely not a representative sample, but on this channel, the games I've caught, Brosterus has actually, in my opinion, looked like the strongest player out there. Um, the way he takes games, the way he's been taking games against the top member players in the field, oh, squad white possibly coming down on this conscript here. But yeah, the way he's been playing and taking games, just absolutely astounding stuff. So I was amazed to see that he was knocked out 3-2 to two against Von Ivan. So he is just out of World Championship contention. Um, so really interesting stuff there. Going to be a couple of weeks before we get to see the thrilling conclusions of that tournament. But um, what an interesting uh, turn of events and an interesting series and an interesting take on the meta. Just Von Ivan doing Von Ivan things, you know. How many times have we seen Von Ivan come into a tournament, unleash a powerful build, particularly a build utilizing highly mobile units that um that produce a bubble of very early game power and then snowballing on that momentum you know that is classic von ivan and uh yeah he still got it he still got it so um <coughs> so we're uh, coming up to what four and a half minutes into this game uh we've got triple cap established here for bapu who's gone ahead and chosen the scavenge doctrine his opponent gonna be running with the uh, soviet airborne doctrine we've got those weapons uh weapon crates coming in now svd rifles starting to pop up on some of these conscripts upping their firepower um uh, and he's gonna need it because at the moment he's on the back foot trailing by nearly 100 tickets at the pre five minute mark always um, always very risky, or um, usually indicative of a game that is going to get very difficult um, as in the late mid game and the late game. Unless he can do something about the scoreline differential as the game goes on, but right now it's dragging on. We've got three, four squads of conscripts against three squads of Volks, Storm Pioneers. We've got a Kubel opening as we've seen this game. Three kills, one star veterancy on that unit, so performing adequately to begin. MG34 squad going to be mixed into the roster here for Bapu, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, Techless. No, I take it back. We have got the uh, support weapon, Campanaya, coming up right now for uh, Watora. So, just uh, the foundations of an interesting game developing here. We've got a little bit of an overdog, underdog, uh, sort of 
what, what's dynamic is the word I'm looking for. Opening up here, Bapu taking a nice lead in the early stages of this game. Uh, we've got fights going on across the map here. Bapu uh, enjoying his early resource uh, advantage here. Going to be putting STGs onto these Volks Grenadiers at relatively early timings here, which is very nice. Uh, I wonder if we'll see them popping up on any other squads. Uh, not just yet, but he'll have the munition shortly. Looks like uh, Watora content for now to be spending his... Uh, his um, Munitions on these weapon crates, boosting the DPS of his conscripts. Very interesting stuff. Nice to see the Soviet Air Airborne Doctrine get a chance to shine on the channel. This is one of my favorite doctrines. Kubel going to stab through and grab the cutoff. This is uh, definitely going to have an impact on the game as we move forward. Nicely done. The enhanced capture rate of that Kubel being used to maximum advantage. Also going to activate detection uh, afforded to it by its one-star veterancy ability. And that's going to provide some much-needed intel about the allied troop movements uh, in the early stages of this game. Um, usually, to be honest, it's not often you see a Kuba Wagon opening, and when you do see a Kuba Wagon opening, it's only a, a certain percentage of those openings that make it through to get an early one star of veterancy and then continue to survive. Um, <clears throat> So it's a relatively low percentage of games that we see an OKW player able to le able to leverage this luxurious detection and fast-moving capturing unit. But uh, Bapu definitely showing he's got the chops, the know-how to do that. So yeah, spiking through to grab this cutoff, probably an optimal use of that uh, of that Kuba wagon. Really nice to see. Looks like the Kuba wagon going to transition here into south to help deal with this massive bubble of allied troops that are moving out right now. We've got another weapons crate coming down here to give additional SVDs to a third squad of conscripts. So definitely arm Coming up right now is uh, is Watora, but he's now trailing by 155 tickets, still under a triple cap. So I believe the time for him to sit back and be arming up his troops has to come to a has to end here. Dansack Spicy Machine Gun going to be airdropped in as well, so he's going to be diversifying his roster here. Kind of a bit confused as to why he built the special weapon campanile. I guess he wants access to the Zis gun shortly. Um, this you cannot call in the. Uh, you cannot call in an M42 AT gun with this, can you? No. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. So yeah, I guess he's buying that because you are compelled to make a tech choice at some point with Soviets, and uh, you know, support weapon campanile does give you access to the mortar tube and the Zis gun, which could very well find uh, find some use as this game goes forwards. Speaking of finding use, these conscripts gonna usefully grab the central VP here, and you know. Get Watora out from under a triple cap here momentarily, but it is only momentarily. Those conscripts immediately force back the Kuba wagon, going to be used to come in here and minimize the amount of time which that was held by Allied forces. And this game is kind of proceeding to look super dire right now for Watora. He is not really showcasing the power of this uh, commander and is off to a really rough start here. There's four, four squads of conscripts against the world, and they are not doing well. Ah, pardon me. So, uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, you need another Dansack, that for sure. How much is this? 1, 2, 5, and 50 to bring in. I think you need another Dansack. Like, absolutely bring in that second Dansack. Try and get one Dansack into this church. Try and push something in north. Um, I don't believe there are any mines. This VP just opened. So, with these conscripts, it seems like you're not going to take a fight with conscripts. Not against a Kubawagen and an MG. Kettenwerfer, by the way, getting mixed into the roster. Schwerpanzer HQ also finishing. Bapu cementing his advantage in this game. 285 under 500 right now for, for Watora. But yeah, you're probably not going to take a fight against Kubawagen MG triple triple vault with, with STGs. So you have to go wide. Um, just constantly, this is what I like, just constantly be, be sending out conscripts. Where's the rest of this squad? This is the most spread out squad. Um, but yeah, just constantly be, be, there we go, that's it. You have to push on a broad front. The Axis player can't be everywhere at, one, at once, not right now anyway. Um, two stars of veterancy now on this Kuba wagon. Also, Lig Gun getting added into the roster. It was a Battle Gripper HQ opening. Sorry, missed this in the early stages of the game. But yeah, that's what we've got right now. The lesser spotted Battle Gripper HQ. Interesting stuff here from Bapu, and I'm interested to see him uh, use this for advantage. Man, this Soviet army just seems to really lack spine, though, doesn't it? He needs to call in these guards, like, right now. Um, I just, I don't know. He needs something better. I mean, 264 at the under 10 minute mark. Still yet to claim a ticket off of the Axis player. Mm, not where you want to be at all, to be honest. Uh, so, this is going to be rough. Axis forces are just holding, maintaining their chokehold in north on the VP. Uh, we've got a mechanized, sorry, tank of E Battalion Command finished up now. T-70 going to be navigating its way onto the field. And, you know, the T-70 represents a ray of hope in this game for the Soviet player. Um, 
you know, T70 openings are always something that the Axis player has to look out for. The, the T70 is rapid, packs a punch, able to vet up nicely, polices pretty much every unit that we have here for the Axis player. But, you know, there's already Kettenwerfer on the field, so its efficiency, uh, its freedom, going to be already curtailed to some extent as the T70 moves out onto the map. So, I don't know, it all comes down to the engagement and the micro. Both players have the tools they need to, to do well in this, uh, as we sort of get into the early stages of the mid game here. And it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's Watora who has everything that he needs to do. Uh, Bapu right now just still pretty comfortably holding the middle line of the map. Some Volks Grenadiers gonna creep back onto the mid. T70 gets committed into south, comes on out into a nice position. Gonna find some damage on, oh, he comes way far forward. That's gonna get Fausted immediately. What are we doing here? I mean, you're never going to get the squad wipe on those storm pioneers. You just ain't going to get it. So just kind of getting fausted needlessly here. He didn't have to drive straight into those Volks. He could have kept his distance back here, plinked away at those Volks from range, kited back if they come forward, conscripts there for support. No need to be taking a Faust. Now he needs to repair this tank. It's just a little bit more time when this tank's not hitting home during this phase of the game. Right now is when this T70 is the representative. If you think of this T70 as a percentage of force on the map, right now the T70 is the biggest share of the, per of the percentage of force on the map that it's ever going to be during this game. As the game goes on, this T70 is only going to feel smaller and smaller as more and more units get added onto the map. So it's usually during this early window that T70s get off to a good start, able to push back one, two, three or more Axis squads, able to give the allied player a little window of time where they have um, opportunities to capture on the map and take some ground. And we're just not seeing that. And because it got hit by a foul, so you know, just makes your T70 a lot less efficient because you have to sit there repairing it. Ostwind? Well, we've got an Ostwind on the queue here from Bapu. I mean, I like it, I suppose. Ost <coughs> Pardon me. Ost Ostwind, one of those units which, um, when you feel like you are significantly ahead as the Axis player, the Ostwind becomes a really appealing choice because it beats all allied units um, up to medium armor. So if you're ahead, that pretty much describes your opponent's entire unit roster. T70 going to get clonked here by the uh, by the Raket and worth a light gun st striking home for damage on the uh, on the DS. Whoa, 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 whoa! A bit of a premature fallback there on the Dansac. You know, this is a six-man healthy squad. It can take another shell or two. You can just reposition it if you like. I don't know about that fallback. But as I was saying about the Ospin, yeah, it, it beats all of the units that you see up here for the Allied player. Um, its DPS is actually pretty high against the targets it's effective against. You know, it does murderify infantry and light vehicles very quickly. Um, it's relatively cheap in terms of fuel compared to other Axis medium armor choices. 100, I believe, the cost. I think it's 100. Let's just quickly... Fair pounds or HQ. Yeah, 100 fuel. So, um, if you have the resource advantage, you can get it out fast. You can get it out even faster relative than, say, a, to, to, say, a Panzer IV, because it costs less fuel. And if you are ahead, then your opponent will probably not have any hard counters to the Ostwin. So, uh, yeah, the Ostwin can really flourish. I mean, you know, a Zis gun, yes, that is a hard counter to an Ostwin, but the Ostwin, with a good flank, will completely, like, obliterate a Zis gun. So that's fine as well, you know. So, yeah, I really like the, um, I really like the Ostwin. Know when you're ahead. You know, have a bit of killer instinct. Get in there with the Ostwin. Make life really hard for your allied opponent. If you sense that you have the upper hand, if you really feel like you are quite far ahead, that's when the Oswin can really shine. Uh, it's not its only use, of course. You can definitely use the Oswin in other ways, but uh, yeah, that's going to be pretty good. A little bit of an, uh, what is this, the assault uh, infiltration tactics. That's the one. Infiltration tactics grenade package going to come through here for no real avail. These conscripts able to wade through, but there are enough Axis units here. Oswin, Storm Pioneers, Kettenwerfer, Kubelwagen. Pardon me, more than enough to push back this little... Uh, this little uh, bulge that the so that the allied player managed to get coming through here. Wow, this T70 just having a hard time. So we've got a mortar tube on the field, which is just immediately going to get forced back. Wow, this is like a textbook example of how games can really snowball out of control when your Axis opponent gets a small advantage in the early game. Um, just horrible here. Every time you see an allied unit falling back, it's just an amount of time that that allied unit is not providing any value out on the field. And oh no. So, I mean, there, there is a Zisk gun here on the field. But, I mean, the Ostwind is just so mobile. There is no reason why this Zisk gun ought to be scoring good hits or even putting together a kill on this Ostwind, assuming Bapu doesn't fall asleep. You know, he's just looking so good. He's got the lion's share of the resource income. He's going to be able to lean so hard. He gets the cutoff yet again, the sneaky Kubel getting in here. And, uh, I mean, 
Watora here down at 150 VPs at the 15 and a half minute mark. That's rough. That is what we say we is rough. So uh, let's see now. We've got Kubelwagen just doing it, plying its trade out on the map, doing what it does best. Scouting, corralling infantry, and capping points. I mean, this is not this is a fine Soviet roster. Like, this is an okay balanced army. I, I like it. This gun, MG, mortar tube, T-70, supporting good core infantry. Fine. Love it. It's just that he's been so far behind on t in terms of map control. He's being severely outclassed and out by the Axis player. Um, and, like, I mean, 73 supply now for the OKW player against 55. Double Kettenwerfer, Light Gun, Triple Well-Equipped Volks, Double MG, Ostwind. I mean, this is a rough spot to be in. Um, I don't really know what the plan is here for Batora. I think just keep trying to go wide. Don't try and take a fight in one place. The Axis player is just going to bat you aside like a, like, a, like a Velociraptor to a kitten. So, um... Yeah, I, I just, uh, you know what, I reckon this is going to be one of those quick casts and we're going to be hopping into another game here momentarily. Um, I just, I feel it, I feel it in the air. Could be wrong, probably right. Nice grenade package coming down here, Bafu not willing to let any potential value slip through and when you're this rich on resources, why would you? Flammenwerfer squad of engineers get taken out here, Volks Grenadiers basking in the flames of glory momentarily. Uh, okay, so Watora manages to connect up a victory point. Nicely done. He has a fuel point. He has a munitions point. It's almost like he is, I don't know, like finding some value out on the map. This is nice. This is nice. This is what I mean about go wide. You can't, you can't hope to win against this Axis roster. Not right now. So you have to play cunning. You have to play canny. You have to play for time. You have to just get the Axis players' attention up here in the north and then push in the south. Just need to constantly be pushing all of the lanes on this map. Is there an MG in this building? Yikes. Mm. So we've got an additional uh, Schwebermatch Schlepper coming out onto the uh, onto the map right now. Bapu looking to complete the OKW tech tree, and that does tell us that his late game plan, should the game actually miraculously find itself in the late game, uh, probably going to be a King Tiger. Hmm. Man, what a horror show. Ostwin policing infantry in mid. Uh, light gun firing shells into the down sack in the church. Conscripts getting repulsed by MGs in north. Kettenwerfer here just in case the T-70 decided to spearhead that assault. But it didn't. T-70's down here in south desperately trying to hold on to this one victory point. Infiltration grenade is going to come through. Conscripts on it though. They're going to move around that one. But this is a lot of DPS. The T-70 is de desperately going to try and chip away here. And it uh, looks like Soviet forces will be able to retain possession of this point for now. Kettenwerfer and a second wave of folks coming in. So probably not for long. Kettenwerfer actually not... Okay, there we go. I was worried that the T-70 might just be trying to get on top of that Kettenwerfer there, but not really, not really going to happen. Mortis, Mortis squad in a good position, but he just needs to be taking barrages. He knows where this is. The Mortis squad's not firing. Just barrage this building down. You don't want this building standing. Um, yeah. <clears throat> All right, 90 tickets now remaining for Batora. This is just a brutal stomp fest so far. Yikes. I mean, yeah. To, to a certain extent, as I have a sip of my tea here. To a certain extent, I feel like um, this is what we're seeing right now is a manifestation of one of the very, very few, but definitely we're feeling the effects of one of the drawbacks of the design of Company of Heroes 2, which is that in any other game, if, if the game had been this one-sided, it wouldn't take 20 minutes to close. Now, although this game has appeared one-sided, the Soviet player is really only a couple of moves away from breaking out and, and bringing the game back to parity. 
Uh, you know, this, this roster of units here is, is definitely potent, and if he was able to contend for a little bit more victory point control in this game, he'd have a lot more tickets to work with. So, although this has been super one-sided, it's really only a couple of moves away from being a much closer game. But it has been this one-sided, and the game has still gone on for 20, 21 minutes. And um, I remember, I'm, I'm minded back to the 90s when RTS was in its sort of the, the, the cradle of creation and there were a lot of games coming out. We had like StarCraft, we had Total Annihilation, we had Command & Conquer, we had Homeworld, we had a lot of games. And um, I was a really big fan of Homeworld. I still am, I think it's, obviously, I think it's an amazing series, one of some of the best games ever made. But Homeworld 1, one thing that my friends and I noticed very quickly with Homeworld 1 is, it's actually quite hard to convert early advantage into a win. For example, StarCraft, okay? You, you, you cheese your opponent as Zerg, you build a very early spawning pool, you get Zerglings out, you kill your opponent. The game can be over inside of five minutes, easily. But in Homeworld, we noticed that if you do a cheesy build like this, and you kind of like win, in quote marks, the game, uh, and this game's over by the way, uh, nice win here for Babu, but yeah, if you win the game early in Homeworld, your starting unit in Homeworld is the Mothership, which has a massive amount of health and enough defense turrets to sort of ward away early squadrons. So it was really hard to snowball basically a complete early stomping domination to an actual win inside of 10 or 12 minutes in Homeworld 1. Um, whereas, um, if you're playing like StarCraft or Total Annihilation, if you crush your opponent, you, you know, you can literally shove them out of the game inside of five or ten minutes, like, pretty easily. Um, now, Company of Heroes, because of the way it's designed, and this is not just like a flat criticism, it's just a feature of the way the game's designed, which has a lot of upsides and a lot of advantages too. The way the game's designed is very clever, and it's it's really great to watch and produces some many great games. But one of the disadvantages is, you do get these games that kind of linger on for 20 minutes, and they were just a one-sided stomp fest. Feels there like one player never really had a look into the game. And to, to, to a certain extent, I sort of wish that... Uh, that um, that these games were, I don't know, just over faster, I suppose? Um, because I don't like using the fast forward bu button when I'm casting, so. Anyway, let's see what we got here. Drunken Susie, uh, no real high high named or high tier players. I guess they're all having a break after the weekend's, uh, after the weekend's games. Um, I think we're just gonna we're just gonna take a gamble here and watch it's Company of Heroes 2 CEO against Prototype on Lost Glider. Um, just gonna open my window here. So yeah, just um, I don't know, just me musing out loud, I suppose, about the the way Company of Heroes Two is designed and how that compares to other RTSs. Um, and it's again, like I say, it's not really a hard criticism. I really do like the way Company of Heroes Two is designed for a, for a number of reasons, but. Nothing's perfect, and it's always worth. It's always interesting to talk about how these design choices impact the game, and you know the final sort of play experience in a in a variety of ways. Anyway, so let's get to business here. Spawning in the north on Lost Glider, playing as the OKW pieces. It's going to be Co2 CEO. I'm probably just going to call it CEO. And the spawning in the south, playing as the Soviet pieces. It's going to be P -p -p Prototype, who is going to go straight ahead here and pick the guard motor coordination tactics. He's going to have the T3485, the heavy mortar tube, the guards infantry, the vehicle crew repairs and of course the mark vehicle ability um this uh, i've said it before i'll say it again just a, a soviet commander that i almost always keep on my roster i find all five of these abilities are great and it's always good to have a commander where you feel like all five of the abilities are super usable and can have meaningful in-game impact as compared to um i don't know for example let's look at grand offensive doctrine great great commander but i feel like only four out of these five abilities ever make a difference in the game because the infrared stg 44 package has the best of intentions but very rarely seems to actually do anything so yeah um a lot of the best commanders in this game only have four or even three out of five like meaningful abilities this one has five and i like them all the t3485 is a nice uh, resource to be able to call upon um as the soviet forces the 120 mil tube can be beautiful um especially when you're playing against vermax but it's also fine against okw um just those four man squads man sometimes they cluster up or you just get a lucky shot and just the 120 mil tube just kind of can really punish those four man squads uh, especially if you get two of them um i like the range it makes the 120 mil tube easier to defend as well and uh i don't know there's something just satisfying about the way it sounds and looks the heavy like donk and then like you know the massive booms you get when those shells hoon in 
really fun unit just i don't know something about it just speaks to me i guess um guards infantry yeah they're always going to be good dp lmgs are useful um and it's nice to have access to either guards or shocks i'm more of a guards player myself just that's the way my play style pans out uh yeah vehicle crew repairs excellent and mark vehicle is just like uh, such a nice tool throughout all stages of the game that it's unlocked it's just really nice um anyway looks like it uh, looks like ceo here gonna be picking the panzer or the, sorry the elite armored doctrine here so he has access to the 221 uh like command half track oh sorry command scout car or whatever it's called the um the like upgraded scout dude uh, what else does he get then? So he gets emergency repairs, he gets the Panzer Commanders, he gets the Tungsten Rounds, and access to the Storm Tiger, should the game reach that phase. Scuffles being taken all across the map here. Looks like... Uh, looks like OKW player wins in south. Um, how is he winning this in mid? Storm Pioneers in heavy cover are just beating two squads of conscripts. I, I guess that makes sense. Uh, and in the west of the map, looks like things falling into allied hands. These conscripts probably want to be active. It's all good and well sitting in a building, but yeah, there we go. Um, two, two, one, half track. Oh, sorry, I keep calling it half track. It's um, two, two, one scout car on its way out now. Zwei hundred Einenswansisch scout car. Uh, we've got the Schwebermach Schlepper out on the field, and we'll probably be informed about our OKW players' tech intentions here momentarily. Uh, I suppose that will have been delayed because he's gone for the 2-2-1 half track. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I just, it's, I just, my brain just wants to say half track after 2 2 one. I don't know why. After the 2 2 one scout car. Oh, wow, those Grenadiers are super low. Wow, CEO here making a bit of an error. Uh, he still has some pixels to give, so no danger of a squad wipe, it seems. Uh, 221 Scout Car going to come to the rescue here. And actually, possibility of a counter squad wipe. Uh-oh, yikes. Have anti-vehicle grenades finished yet? They have not. This Scout Car is... Fa oh, no. Storm Pioneers were here. That's an early squad wipe. That's a, that's a pre-five-minute squad wipe. Yikes. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's always a hard game where you lose a core infantry unit at the sub five minute mark. That just means you're going to be behind and it's very difficult. Um, there's just a certain tone that games take once that happens. So, okay, anti-vehicle grenades is on the way, but it ain't here yet. Looks like it's going to be a uh, support weapon camp and I for the Soviet player. So, this gun, small tubes, uh, Maxim. Going to be the options uh, provided by that building. I imagine we'll see some Maxims on the field here. But now we're on three squads of conscripts versus four squads of Volks plus Storms plus 221 Scout Car. Yeah, you can oorah your heart out, boys. It's not going to help. Um, this is rough. So, yeah. Um, whilst this game sort of continues and I keep the camera focused on the action as best I can, thinking a little bit more about um, this world championship tournament and some of the games i saw and because uh, obviously i was i was kind of keeping an eye on the twitch chat at the same time and getting a feel for what the community and players were sort of thinking about the meta and thinking about the way the games were going and um so some of the comments i was making on a previous video now again i only get to cast the videos or i only get to cast the matches i cast and that i, I really don't have too much more time in my life um for company of heroes like or video games in general so I only really get to cast those games and like occasionally I watch somebody else's casts or occasionally, you know, I'm on the ladder playing some games, but I do mostly just cast the game. So it's hard for me to get um, a, a real representative feeling for the meta. But based on the comments I was seeing on chat, what I was saying about um, OKW and US forces being like the dominant choices on the ladder and in the meta does seem to be like not just something I'm seeing in the particular matches I've cast. Like a lot of people were saying in the Twitch chat, yeah, it's like USF versus OKW is like the main meta. Um, definitely the other factions are picked from time to time. Certain players have spicy builds and stuff like that. But on a given day between any two given players, you can be fairly safe sort of predicting that it will probably be OKW for the Axis player and American forces for the Allied player. So yeah, that was um, interesting to see that that feeling that I'd gotten from the games I was watching had kind of come out true here. Yikes, explosion comes down. Now, I've been told the explosion does damage, particularly to vehicles, but the fire here does not from these barrels. So, whoa, these guards are just getting chopped down. Bro, prototype, you have to fall back. 
Yo, ho, ho. staying for a little too long there. These guards probably not going to be in jeopardy, but trading out a lot of models. Guards, infantry models, not the cheapest, so you don't really want to be trading them out. And it didn't really feel like he was getting anything meaningful for the trade out. Sometimes it's okay to force squads back, like, before they're down to three or two men. Sometimes it's okay to just be like, this is a five or six man squad that is going to lose four models for no value in the next three seconds. I'm just going to fall it back. Uh, so it feels like Prototype just kind of a little over ambitious there. I don't really know. I mean, I know he wanted to stay for the grenade, but even then he stayed a little longer than the grenade. Um, so, yeah, just, I don't know, some questionable decision making there, perhaps. 2G1 Scout card, 9 kills on this monster. It has the, um, the aerial, which gives it the signal reload and lockdown abilities. Let me just see. I, I always have to, so enable lockdown, increased resource production. Noise. And signal relay. Uh, locate enemy vehicles in the fog of war. Nice. I'm so glad that they made Panzer Elite just a much more three dimensional and textured commander. Like, he used to be very, like, mono dimensional with his offerings. It was just all. If you didn't have, like, a Panzer IV or better on the field, it felt like the Panzer Elite doctrine. The, sorry, the Elite Armored doctrine really wasn't giving you a lot. Whereas now. You have the early game utility of the 221 Scout Car, which is quite a nuanced unit and provides a lot of interesting abilities. They're fun to use, they're fun to watch, they can be leveraged for great advantage, but they're not risk free. The 221 is very fragile, requires a lot of micro, um, and it interacts really interestingly in the early phases of the game with all of your opponent's early game units, and that's really nice to see. That's the kind of intelligent unit design, the kind of intelligent balance consideration, the kind of intelligent, I don't know gameplay targeted decisions and, and implementation I'm really excited about this community balance team sort of bringing through it's units like the 221 scout car getting added into this commander that suddenly give it a whole new lease of life this commander is just so much more exciting to watch and play in all stages of the game just great job just great job just I don't know I don't know why I'm choosing now to talk about this but it's just really interesting okay so what do we got here Oh yeah, sorry, it's guards, so they've got, they got the DPLMG, sorry, I just saw the DP pop up, so I was like, okay. Thought I'd click on that. So Maxim's now being mixed into the roster. But look at this, let's crack the tack, oh my goodness, look at this. This is a pretty gross situation for the allied player. Under a triple cap, once again, Mr. Anderson. And, yeah, things just going pretty bad. Like, a lot of great trades being taken out on the map by the OKW player. Ugh, stun Grenade comes down on all these conscripts. Just more damage coming in. Actually, that's going to buy enough time for these uh, STG-toting Storm Pioneers to get into the critical range here. Actually, they're going to get around to the side of the building where there are no windows. So, just masterful stuff here by CEO. Kind of... Oh, no, then he even gets into the building once the conscripts are out. Really? This is, like, for one squad of Storm Pioneers to be not just, like tying up but beating three soviet units oh my goodness i mean they've got two stars of veterans here as well which really helps because that represents a huge step up in dps for the storm pioneers oh no he's just totally winning this against all these soviet squads this is so much value for these storm pioneers to be not just tying up but beating oh no 120 mil tube though going to be coming out onto the field so you know perhaps the appearance of a fresh unit going to be Gonna be making something of a difference here. My fingers are crossed for this allied player. Prototype just down at 336 VPs under 500 at the 10 minute mark. Not quite as grim as the last game we cast, but I mean, I feel like we've seen this story before. Um. I mean, Schwer Panzer HQ gets finished up in this location. The 221 Scout car is on signal relay. Sorry, it's on lockdown mode. Generating additional fuel resources. I want to know how much it actually generates, but it doesn't seem to tell me. How much are you generating, sir? Oh, well, we don't know. So, yeah, he's harvesting the extra fuel. Plus 43 is it? intimidating amounts of fuel income. 120 mil tube going to be flumping some shells forward here. Seemingly yet to find any meaningful impacts, but uh, we can look forward to those hopefully as this game continues. Oh my goodness, this is just a Soviet player is just firmly on the back foot right now. 
And when your income is this poor, your teching is going to be so um, delayed. Come on. Oh, I was really hoping that 120 mil shell was just going to come into the middle of those two squads. Just like something to try and turn this game around. We've already got a Panzer IV on the queue. Monstrous stuff here from a, pro, from a CEO, sorry. Getting off to a fine start. Really uh, driving the knife in. This gun will be purchased here. There are guards with, DP, with um, uh, DP LMGs. We've got anti-vehicle grenades on the conscripts. But this is going to be a big ask for our Soviet player to be able to really meaningfully touch this Panzer IV here. As long as CEO doesn't fall asleep or make any sort of huge mistakes or errors of judgment. Um, you know, this is... Uh, we're in trouble town now for Prototype. 120mm tube desperately flailing away at this MG. There are shoe mines on the roads here. Uh, because, you know, CEO has been swimming in resources this game. All of his Volk squads are upgraded. Uh, he doesn't actually have enough for the pinsel mounted MG42 at the timing when this Panzer IV comes out, which is like, you know, a minor concern. But Engineers here going to shortly find out the bad news, I imagine. Does the Soviet player actually know about this. Oh no, he doesn't actually even know that the Schwer Panzer HQ is there. Well, he's going to find out the bad news at some point. Panzer IV going to be rumbling on forward. Probably looking for these engineers here. Finds them. Insty fallback. Panzer IV here just going to be rolling forwards. Angling for additional damage. Oh, he went for the tank commander. Oh, of course he went for the tank commander. Yeah. So he went for the tank commander up upgrade, which only cost 30 munitions, actually, so... Yep, that's fine. Axis forces here still maintaining a triple cap, 247 tickets and counting for a prototype, who's still yet to claim a single VP off of the scoreline of his Axis opponent here. 120mm tube basically hasn't moved outside of the base. I think, like, at one point it got some shells into this building, but yeah. Just been firing from the base. Never the beginning of a good story. It's finding some near misses here, getting some veterancy uh, and a kill, but not finding any of those big showy bullseye hits that can sort of uh, help turn games. And uh, there's definitely a game that needs some uh, needs some turning here for Prototype. Um, no sign of the Tangavi Tangavi command either, uh, which he could have actually. He's floating a stack of fuel right now. So, just being a little bit tardy with his teching, but that's okay. Uh, it's not really like he has the manpower. Is this gun able to finally find some shots onto a Panzer IV? Yikes, just bouncing off that front armor. At least it hit. <laughs> that Panzer IV just really testing the range on this Sis gun. Just gonna have to creep it forwards here. Um, I feel like you need more guard squads here somehow, or yeah, like one more guard squad would be nice. Uh, conscript squad here. Oh, man, look at this. The allied player just right, just corralled right into his base. 172 tickets and counting. 120 mil tube, trying to do work. Uh, yeah, I don't often do this, but I may speed this one up. It's looking a bit stompy. Uh, so we've got some fighting going on over here. Mark vehicle comes down. Uh, I'm just going to fast forward this one for now. It's looking pretty brutal. So is that a Storm Tiger? Oh, I thought he just took a Storm Tiger for a second. Um, but no, he's going to go for the extra truck here. 118. Oh, gosh. Uh, that's my doorbell. I'll be right back. Sorry.
Target vehicle marking available. Hey, that was uh, an Amazon delivery for someone else's building. It's a Storm Tiger! Hey. Well, there we go. Some entertainment value may potentially... Oh my goodness me. You know it's a bad game. This is like reminiscent of comp stomps when you've just got a Panzer IV just chewing into someone's base. Why not? Storm Tiger here, so potentially some entertainment value going to be provided by the mighty Storm Tiger, which could cast forward its... Um, what is this thing? It's like a 300mm rocket or something. Here it goes. Whoosh! Going to fire through... <clears throat> Turns out we can't fire through that building. A little bit embarrassing there. Um... <laughs> okay, right, well, that's that one. Okay, come on, we're going to go and look for another game. I just want to see two epic players who are like dream game. What, what, I, Brosrus versus Jove or something. That would be, that'd be lovely. Von Ivan versus S. Price or, you know, just... Mm. I know we're not going to see it, but a caster can dream. We're going to go and have a look. Da 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 da. Alright, here we go. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like there are no truly great players out here at the moment. Well, we're going to risk one more game. We're going to risk one more game. Crossing in the Woods. Always a good map. One of my very favourites. Might be my very favourite, actually. Sorry, I'm just, um, my phone is, like, exploding right now with messages and calls, but <clears throat> I was just briefly looking at it to, uh, <laughs> to assess the situation. Uh, ever the too busy right now. Right, okay, here we go. So, crossing in the woods. P -p -p Pawning in the south. P -p -p Playing as the OKW forces. It's PFC. And a spawning in the north, playing as the Soviet forces. It's Hazuki Watora. Alrighty then, last game for this casting session. Our final hope of a close game, our final hope of true glory, true metal, true courage, lies on the shoulders of PFC and Watora here. Can they deliver a game which is not a one-sided stomp fest? Time will tell. Coming to a channel near you. One caster's desperate search for a game that is not a one-sided stomp fest. Cut to a picture of me, like, on my knees in the pouring rain, screaming at the sky. No! Um. Alright. Alright. Not much to speak about so far. Looks like PFC going to be going for a Vargan opening. You know, actually. Um, so, alright, yeah. Let's, let's go back to talking about the World Championship games I watched once again, which is like my standard filler for the first few minutes of each game today. Oh. But um, yeah, seriously. Um, so one adaptation that we saw Brosterus make, actually, and it nearly worked in Game 5 to the WC51 spam. Oh, it's not spam, but to the early double, the early double WC51. Ooh, that's a bit of a tongue twister. Um was, uh, yeah, mixing in more Kuba Wagons. Of course, the Kuba Wagon actually quite decent against WC-51s, able to plink them down at decent range um, and pretty much without answer until those WC-51s get the 50 cals. And even with the 50 cals, the Kuba Wagon still were punching for good value against those trucks. So, um, yeah, we saw Rostris go for a couple of Kuba Wagons. And to be fair, it was oh, he was so close. He very nearly broke the WC-51s. It was only Ivan's insane micro and decision making that was able to keep those WC-51s in the game. And not just in the game, but meaningfully, not just like feeding veterancy onto the Kubals. Um, but there we go. OKW players, Axis players, players generally, if your opponent is doing WC-51 things, then you can do Kubal things. And it seems like the ingredients are there for the appropriate counter. Like we're seeing already, if you like, that that's, that's a potentially profitable tech route or unit route that you can take against WC-51s uh, to limit their effectiveness and um, and uh, yeah, well, yes, yeah, to limit their effectiveness. <laughs> All right, here battle lines being drawn already. OKW player looking to have slightly more than half of the map, so uh, looking to be a good start again for our Axis player. 
This would be like three out of three if we see Soviet forces getting stomped by OKW again. Okay, finally, a Watora here able to put together a fight against a unit of Volks in the early game. Something that we've not really seen anyone be able to do today. Uh, able to get some Volks to fall back. Nice. Uh, Conscript pushing past the halfway point on the map. Looks like we've got Storm Pioneers digging deep on the other side of the map. But uh, Conscript's also going to be policing these guys back. Should be able to grab back the ground that was stolen. We're going to crack the tack here, get an overview of where these players have opted to deploy their forces in these early stages of the game. We've got a squad of Volks out in far west, going to be grabbing the fuel. So even if he loses all these fights in mid, it's kind of okay here for PFC because he's going to be able to grab the fuel point over there. And um, yeah, Conscript's pushing hard here, but not actually getting a cutoff or anything. Some, uh, okay, sorry, I thought for a moment this squad was idle, but they are heavily depleted, now falling back, going to get reinforced, rearms, rejoin the fight. Uh, let's check the tech. Oh, we've got a airborne troops commander choice again for Watora. Uh, no tech buildings as yet, but that's one of the nice things about this commander. You don't actually need tech buildings as early because you can put the uh, SVD rifles onto your conscripts. You can buy the Dansack machine gun, so you have some diversity, some extra poke being added to your roster just by taking this commander. Now, we'll probably see him. Yep. Go for the uh, support weapon campanile. I was about to say that because you still do need ZIS guns and mortar tubes are a nice option to have. Um, and I feel like if you're going for this commander, it's probably going to be relatively rare that we see penal, penal troops taken because you can already give your conscripts SVDs. So some of the value of those penals is kind of like mm, neutralized by the fact that your conscripts are kind of have those guns already. Now, I believe if you give the penals these things, they get PPSHs, right? Yeah. And... That's something of a mixed blessing. Obviously, it increases their DPS over short ranges, but decreases it at mid and long ranges. So the PPSH package, not quite as appealing for penals as the SVD package is for conscripts. And I think for this, for these reasons, we usually see um, a uh, support weapon campanile opening when we see the Soviet airborne. Um, that said... I don't know, actually. I may be talking out my hat here because when I play this Doctrine, I almost always go for a special rifle opening anyway just because penals are boss. And I always use, like, at least two squads of conscripts even if I am using penals. And putting SVDs on those conscripts is still worthwhile. The Dansack's still worthwhile. And I just love a clown car opening. I, I do just love a clown car opening, me. It's just good fun. Good, clean clown fun. Forward element! Flammenwerfer engineers here getting a lovely flank on some uh, on some Volks grenadiers. Nice stuff there. Uh, crack the tack and we can see Watora's position though. Becoming dangerously compacted. Uh, only able to wrest control over about a third of the map right now. Uh, and crucially not able to connect or deny either of the two fuel points just now. So that fuel, uh, fuel differential looking pretty vicious. 13 for the Soviet player. 36 for PFC's OKW forces here. So, I mean, that is almost... A multiple that is almost a factor of three pretty dangerous stuff here and uh, that's you know we've got a panzer two coming up here nice and early the soviet roster just has nothing for a panzer just has nothing let's just quickly check do we have at grenades yikes so this panzer two gonna be um really powerful gonna totally be the kingmaker on the field how is it that we're just i don't know man just seems like allied forces on the ladder today just getting spanked by okw stuff um, so a nice little uh, nice little surround here, good concave being set up by the Axis forces. Conscript's just feeding into this pocket here, but it's, it's just not a good fight. Too many Volks. LMG here as well. Uh, we're probably going to see... It. Oh, so incendiary grenade going to force back Conscript's over here. Oh no, everything just starting to go PFC's way here. That Panzer II maneuvering its way out onto the field. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, just looks kind of horrendous right now. So... Oh, but he did just lose some Volks Grenadiers around here. Oh, what? These Volks Grenadiers got picked down? Oh, wow. Okay, well, PFC going to lose some of his core infantry. That is a big blow. And the kind of ray of hope that Watora needs to stay in this game. As you've just heard, Falstrom Jaeger are combat ready. Um, so that means PFC has taken the Luftwaffe Ground Forces Doctrine. Um, the very spicy uh, Falstrom Jaeger is going to be on the field. Now, this is something else that I learned from, from hanging out in the Twitch chat on uh, during the World Championship broadcast. Apparently, these Falstrom Jaegers are relatively meta, despite the fact that I'm not seeing them too often on my channel. A lot of people are just using Falstrom Jaegers, using this Doctrine. Falstrom Jaeger is very powerful, um, so just a lot of people 
using this powerful unit to sweep allied forces away. Um, Panzer II just coming in here. No real answers. Okay, AT grenade research has finished. Donk, gonna get the gonna get the engine on that one. Save this very very terrified conscript squad who is falling back. They are gonna make it back. Medic's gonna tend to them. They're gonna get reinforced. So, I think if you lose that conscript squad there, it's like so horrendous. But luckily, that's not the case. And this um, Axis roster, whilst it is superior in tech and composition diversity, actually is relatively small due to the loss of the Volks Grenadiers earlier on. So this game, you know, there is, it's not all going PFC's way. Some, like, Watora has found, has drawn blood against this Axis player. More more than we've seen from basically, oh no. From basically, oh no. More than we've seen from basically every other Allied player today uh, in, in, in the other games. So, you know, there is that. The scoreline as well, look at this. He's actually taken some tickets away from his Axis opponent. He's actually got a scoreline advantage even. I mean, not, not much, nothing to write home about, and he is presently under a triple cap, so it's not going to last very long. But, you know, this is the best allied play we've seen today. So there we go, noteworthy on those grounds, I suppose. Oh no, oh, well, that's one way to... It's <laughs> one way to lose some conscripts there. Conscripts just running into kiting, ac kiting light armour. Um, pretty brutal stuff there. Kubawagen, Panzer II, absolutely viciously efficient against these units. And look, here's the thing. You know, all of these Axis units are back home repairing. You'd think this might be a natural window of opportunity for the Soviet player to get something done, but he's not rooting any units into the east of the map. He's just sending them all over here, where there's already a Kubawagen and a Panzer II expertly kiting forward and backward, corralling this infantry. But uh, it looks like actually the damage on these units is enough. They're going to have to fall back and repair. Mechanized Regiment uh, has finished here. So... Um... Pardon me, it, it ain't over yet. Soviet forces are able to grab a VP, crucially. He's going to grab fuel momentarily. He's going to grab middle VP, hopefully. So, not the end of the world here. Up to two squads of Falsham Jaegers now. MG34 getting mixed into the roster, and the Axis uh, problem earlier on of having uh, being a bit thin on the ground in terms of infantry, uh, that is no longer the case. These Falsham Jaegers find themselves under the arc of a Maxim, conscripts here in support. I imagine, hopefully, Watora will be able to push them back and start pushing out into the east of the map. He desperately needs to hold some of the ground over there to make this, to bring this game back to parity. Zis gun present and correct. Going to be using the Zis gun barrage here. Finds the MG34, but the accuracy on this barrage leaving something to be desired. Uh, not actually finding any real damage. Wow, look at the spread on this barrage. That's pretty unlucky there for uh, Watora. Looks like the Panzer II going to come in here. Falsham Jaeger likewise. An immediate fallback needed on those conscripts to prevent them from dying horribly. Uh, so looks like West Fuel will be falling back into Axis hands momentarily here. STG toting Volks doing obscene amounts of damage as well. Panzer II actually just not quite close enough to pursue these units. So Watora does manage to escape with his units intact. But I mean, let's crack the tack. There's just nothing going right on this map for the Allied player. This has been a recurring story this morning. Don't know... Um, it's just it's just what's going down. I suppose this is perhaps one of the hazards of uh, playing on the or, or casting from the live ladder is there's no guarantee that you're necessarily going to catch a good game. Usually I do though, but I guess every so often you're going to get a going to get a day like today where the games don't look close. I mean I, maybe I'm writing this one off too early, but it is not looking good for Watora right now. But this is why I like to cast off the live game ladder, you know? You just get to see real people playing the game right now. You get to see a, a look at the meta, live, in action, out there, in the wild. And um, I'll be honest with you, just because a game is one-sided doesn't mean that I don't enjoy it. Um, I mean, that the games this morning have not been the best advocate for that sentence, but... Just because a game is one-sided, sometimes I still learn a lot. Sometimes it's really nice to see a great player just just bully someone down you know sometimes it's just really nice to see a player execute fantastically and just like take a game very convincingly um and you know for these reasons this is why i like to cast off of the live game ladder um if uh, if that kind of thing is going on you know i often do enjoy it these games haven't looked particularly close and they also haven't been super exciting though so it's it's not every game 
Not every game can be amazing. Alright, so uh, looks like Matora able to put together a fight over here. He has the Zisk gun in the hood. As long as he doesn't get caught with his trousers down by a Panzer II from an unexpected angle, he should be okay. Panzer II going to be coming in here. Zisk gun floundering around, actually not facing the right direction. So the Panzer II getting the flank here. Zisk gun has to respond, and it will immediately turning. Here we go. Ba -ba -ba -ba. But this Panzer II is flanking real fast right now. Zisk gun lines it up. Boom. Gets a penetrating hit. Nicely done. Uh, what's this? T-70 coming out at a nice timing. Panzer II somewhat in jeopardy. Faust toting. Sh uh, Jaegers come forward here and break the engine. So the T-70 here is not going to be able to pursue the Panzer II. What? MG-34 catches like four squads in its arc. That's pretty efficient. Holy spoons. But this gun barrage might be able to break the lock. And that it does. Almost finding a squad wipe here. So some things starting to go okay for Watora, who, if I crack the tack, needs them to, because he has, like, nothing going on in terms of the map right now. Actually, you know what? He was able to hold on to one of the VPs this time, so... Mm, that means that he wasn't... He's not bleeding out at a catastrophic rate. Obviously, he is still bleeding out, and that's, like, not really acceptable, but... At least he's not, like, dying super rapidly. Combat engineers are standing by. Or at least he's not turbo dying, I suppose. That's another way of putting that. Mm -hmm. Alright. T70. T70 coming out here at a much better timing, owing to the much less one sided. I mean, it's still been quite one sided, but less one sided early game. So this T70 coming out at a time where it can challenge the Panzer II when the AT resources of the OKW player are not as well set up. We don't have any Kettenwerfers on the field yet. Uh, this is still a lot of Faust and a, and, a, and, a, and a Panzer II. Now we have a Panzer IV coming though. So that's tough. Uh, I mean the Soviet player is still miles away from any really superior, like any, any advanced tech really. So this Panzer IV is going to be the kingmaker on the field for quite some time. I believe we'll need to see another Zisk gun out here or else it's just might just be able to to punch through for the win here. This Panzer IV, they're gonna, we're going to need to see additional AT resources added into the roster here for Batora. <laughs> Got some mines appearing in various positions here. That is going to help. Um, I actually quite like the positioning of some of these mines, uh, shoe mines here for the German player. They were actually detected, so uh, Watora ought to be aware of the positioning of these mines if he was paying attention. Probably probably was. Um, but yeah, I, I like the positioning on these mines. The Axis player clearly has the upper hand. He's going to be looking to overrun through areas like this that are controlled by Soviet forces right now. So those mines in a nice position. Panzer IV or a Panzer II could be falling foul of those as this game goes on. FG42 upgrades beginning to finish up now on the Fausham Jaegers. How much does that cost anyway? I'll be able to check in a second. Oh my goodness, the DPS on these units is so intense. STG wielding Volks, STG wielding Storm Pioneers. There's a Maxim here at the back, just heroically suppressing some of these units. T70 chipping in for damage. Panzer II comes in from the flank, though, finding some shots into the T70. T70 not going to re... Okay, now he retargets this gun as well, pinging back the Panzer II. Watora beginning to put together a convincing fight into the teeth of this relentless Axis war machine. But now the Axis medium comes in to tip the scales, approaching from the west here. This gun repositions some how Vatora still holding this position against such such superior numbers of Axis, uh, such superior units and numbers. Storm Pioneers in jeopardy here. Panzer II holding up the fullback, but they do manage to get out. Maxim Gun still chewing away. Sorry, it's a Dansek, of course, the spicy MG. Um, just chewing away at the damage back there. Nice stuff. Somehow Vatora holds onto this position, deflects all of that Axis force. How? Wow. I mean, holding on here. Impressive. I didn't think he'd be able to do that well. Panzer IV going to dive in again here, looking for more damage. Finds the T-70, gets a nice hit. Looks like the Panzer... Sorry, Volksgrenadiers supporting from the west here. Dansack machine gun. Not much good against a Panzer IV. Unsupported at present. Probably going to have to pull this one back, and he does. Engineers harassing fuel. Watora just making moves out on the map. He's trying to do stuff, and I appreciate it. You know, he's actually... This is damage. Like, decapping this point is damage. Uh, Axis infantry, mm, pretty far away from being able to retake this one anytime soon. So, that this does represent genuine fuel losses that he's inflicting on the Axis player. That's nice. 
So he's, he's getting stuff done against with an inferior allied roster against this horrendous Axis roster. Um, you know, I've seen games go worse. I've seen two games go worse just this morning. So, you know, credit where credit's due. Batora getting something done. Now, he is down at 280 under 417, and this has still been a story of Axis domination. He's never been able to hold more than half the map here as uh, Watora, and um, he's always been behind in tech. He's always been behind on resources. He's always been behind on the scoreline, but this, so far, the best story of Soviet resistance against a crushing Axis war machine that we've seen this morning. But it is still a story of Soviet resistance against a crushing Axis war machine. Uh, so we've got another Shvevamak Schlepper coming out onto the field night right now, looking to complete the tech tree. A battle group at HQ will be appearing momentarily. What are these? Are you laying a trip mine? Nice. Was that 15 munitions? 10. Love it. <clears throat> Alright, Panzer II comes in here for a scouting push. Gonna get deflected by a Zisk gun in a nice position. Dansack also here, but it looks like these Falsham Jaegers gonna find their way around the arc. Forces a fallback. Conscripts pinned down in the open. Incendiary ammo getting flailed in here from an MG 34. Panzer. Sorry, it's the T 70 holding the line against these Volks. And it looks like Hatora. Sorry, Watora. Somehow able to hold this position for now i don't know panzer 4 comes diving in there's just nothing here the zisk gun already committed to firing in a different direction we saw a zisk gun barrage but that gets interrupted t70 comes through two zisk guns actually neither of them facing the right way falschirm jaegers in the mix on the fallback path brutal stuff the mines remember are here the tm35s but the panzer 4 just hasn't hasn't gone there and now we just have two zisk guns with no support against a lot of anti-infantry stuff that's piling in from every direction. And this looks grim. This does look grim. If you lose the Zisk guns, you probably lose the game. And those Zisk guns are lost. Uh, this Panzer IV taking some hits here. Ah, oh, just not finding these mines. The mine detector is here, actually. So the Axis player does see them. What the storm of it comes in for the Panzer IV kill. Nice! Matora manages to salvage a medium tank kill against this and forces PFC, it appears, to choose another Panzer IV. Now, PFC's units are all quite exhausted right now. He's going to have to fall back. So, oh my god. I mean, Watora just taking these heroic fights, but taking heroic fights on the back foot is not enough to win. You need to take the map. You need to take the fight to your Axis opponent. Watora, though, putting together, some, despite, I mean, he's under the gun. That was a pretty heroic fight. He gets out of that with one of his Zisk guns. The other one's salvageable, which he needs to do immediately and will. Um, he kills a Panzer IV against all the odds, and he forces the Axis player to go back, go go away, or go home, and maintains control over a fuel, a munitions, and a victory point. Honestly, given the way that fight looked going into it, I mean, that is beyond what I thought that Watora would have been able to achieve in that fight. So, you know, I do tip my hat to Watora right now. He's, he is, he's losing the game in the best way. Like, he's making it look great despite losing horrendously. So, you know, this is okay. This is better than losing horrendously and, and just getting crushed and looking bad. So, four stars on this Kuba wagon. <laughs> it's just too much for me to deal with right now. Hmm. All right, so now the questing tendrils of Axis force start pushing their way into the allied portion of the map. Uh, auto cannons and machine guns chattering away as PFC figures out where the allied units are right now. T-70 gets committed to the fray. The Storm Pine is probably not long for the front at this rate. And uh, to be honest, forcing back only a squad of engineers with these two light vehicles, not the worst that things could have been. Mechanized Bridgerman HQ is finished and we do see a T-34 on the queue. So Soviet medium armor going to be taking the field here. Not my favorite choice, to be honest. The T-34, when you're pretty much behind in a game, usually tends to look pretty bad for reasons that I've sort of talked about at length in other videos on the channel. Uh, but a T-34, it is going to be the choice here. And this, one of the less bad, bad T-34s. As in, I still think this is a bad T-34, but it's one of the least bad of the bad T-34s I've seen picked in recent times. Uh, clearly, this is a game where Watora is close to being able to wrest map control and take this game back to parity. And a T-34 does arrive quickly and, oh, nice, and uh, also represents just 
it represents his best way of being able to take this game back to parity soon. I still think I would prefer waiting for an SU-85. I mean, he... I, maybe he feels like if he doesn't build this T-34, he'll die before he ever gets a, a, an SU-85 on the field, and that is a reasonable feeling to have right now. So it all comes down to this T-34, which is awkwardly exposing side armor here, and the turret not properly rotated. Panzer II comes in. It's probably going to get zip nipped off by the Zis gun, right? No. Ah, oh, but the T-34 gets it. It's only abandoned. Oh, my God. PFC getting quite lucky there. All right, so an abandoned Panzer II is getting repaired rapidly. Uh, Dansack Spicy MG, nope, has to fall back. Thinking about coming in to look for that one there. T-34 could move into the hood and look for a finishing touch, but that's so risky against an Axis player. You know it's quite well set up. He comes for it, though. Supporting infantry is coming. Two Zis, gun there's two Zis guns just behind this T-34, so bear that in mind as well. Uh, wasting its first shell into this Kubel wagon, but now it comes forward. The uh, well, the Panzer II gets recruited by these Storm Pioneers, though. Whoa, he's coming so far forward with the T-34. I don't think you can do this. You have to be... Whoa! Ah, uh, if you lose this T-34, if anything bad happens to the T-34, you lose this game. So, Batora there, taking a chance, but maybe he has to take a chance. Uh, he holds, finally, two of the VPs, so he's off the clock, taking some points off of his Axis opponent. That is nicely done. He still doesn't control very much of the map. He still only controls zero fuel points, which is risk. Uh, tasking some conscripts right now with moving across to grab that fuel point. But, I mean, I have been consistently impressed. The last three or four big fights that Watora has taken, I think he's punched well above his weight. And now, I would say he has brought this game to the minimum possible definition of what I could call parity, insofar as he is off the clock. Now, we're going to see how long this is going to last. The Axis player has um, more than enough time and the l a luxury right now to get his entire army up to fighting fit. Um, and now the Axis player gets to come out in earnest and uh, try and wrest back map control. And he may very well be able to do that. We're going to have to see. T-70 here going to take Faust for its troubles. And that's fine. Panzer four. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Panzer IV waiting in the wings, waiting, lurking for an opportunity. Going to come forward around about now. The tech tree completed for our um, Axis player. The fuel ticking in steadily. The King Tiger lurking on the horizon. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it may very well be that uh, Batora able to fight a heroic fight here. Um, and it might still all be for naught. Mixing in a light gun into the composition right now is PFC. But yeah, I mean, even assuming that... Uh, Watora is able to establish a phase of, of, of parity or domination here. Um, will he have a plan? Will he be prepared? Will he be able to deal with a King Tiger that's coming in the not too distant future? We're going to have to find out. We're going to have to find out. This seems unlikely, but we're going to have to find out. Let's see. Uh, so, okay, he's stacking 60 fuel. I mean, if he starts saving for an SU-85 and gets that as his next unit, then I could see a world where he's able to not die immediately to a King Tiger. I'm just getting a little bit cold here, just going to put my hoodie on, just bear with me here. There we go. So yeah, um, I don't know. Panzer IV are going to be taking some shots. Just looking for value, both players getting set up with a nice battle line across this river in the middle of this map. And again, it feels like Axis, Axis forces is just not trading very well here. I don't think you can afford to just sort of set up your Axis battle line and sort of slow push and rub up against the Soviet units, hoping that that will be enough to displace them. This Soviet army now, big, good veterancy, decent equipment, nice composition. Axis units, traditionally, like model for model, pound for pound, more expensive and elite or more... I mean, you just can't afford to be trading one for one against this Soviet roster. That is what the Soviet player wants right now. So I feel like as the Axis player, you have to take a more specific, a more targeted, a more scalpel-like approach to this game. Like, move out specifically to take certain areas of the map. It's okay to split your army into two pieces, it's okay to push left and right, or it's okay to push mid and one flank, or, you know, tax the Soviet player and bring the overwhelming firepower of your Axis roster to bear. Don't take general engagements, don't just move out generally on the map looking for a window. Like, I feel like with the Axis player, like I say, you need to be more specific, you need to be more targeted right now. 
So it looks like uh, mines here are going to be effective against uh, these Falsham Jaegers. T-34 going to police those units out of that section of the map. Now the T-34 not really very valuable apart from that in this area of the map. So I imagine we might see that transition into mid here momentarily. Has to be careful, but you know what? There's no Kettenworth on this roster. So this T-34 is flourishing. Uh, how much fuel are we on? Okay, 240 fuel. Manpower beginning to stack up. So KT on the horizon. 106 fuel stacked up right now for Hazuki. So I imagine we're going to see... I mean, it has to be the SU-85, right? He knows... He must know it's KT. If it wasn't King Tiger, by now he would have seen so many more other Axis fuel units, you know? Like, what has he seen so far? Panzer II and Panzer IV. That is... That leaves a lot of fuel unaccounted for. Um, for an opponent who has had, like, the run of the field, who has had the domination of the fuel points for most of this game. Panzer II... Uh, sorry, Panzer IV comes forward, scoring some damage on the T-34. Uh, has to play it relatively scarce. Light gun being quite effective now against all of this ax all of this allied supporting infantry. So nice to see a light gun flourish here. Uh, here comes Panzer IV, looking for damage. Going to be taking some damage, though. This gun nicely set up in the flank. We've got two more Zisk guns coming across the bridge. This is the kind of target that light guns live for, though. Uh, just finding epic amounts of damage. Hooning in here. There we go. Finally, uh, finally, Watora going to spread these units out as well. He needs to. This light gun will be punishing him. Um, and okay, we're at Tiger Fuel now. Tiger Two Fuel. We just need a little bit more manpower. But yeah, we're going to see Tiger Two here, and that is scary. Look at this scoreline, though. Watora making an actual game of this. My hat goes off to him. This has been a rough start that he is able to pull back right now. Um, so the question is, is he going to be ready for the KT? He has SU85 money. He needs to click the button. If he can get that... Okay, here comes the KT. If he can get that SU-85 out in a timely manner, come on. You have to buy it. You have to buy it now. You know it's going to be a KT. Okay, here comes the SU-85. There we go. Not too late, but it's like every second counts right now because that KT... Every second you delay this SU-85 is a few more seconds where this KT is just going to have absolute reign of the field. And uh, that's going to be scary. But yeah, Watora, as I was saying, correctly identifying. He hasn't seen any other Axis fuel spending. That is a conspicuous absence that does tell you, even without seeing the tech buildings, you know, it's going to be a KT. And um, here comes the KT right now. And this is one of those maps that's quite small. So the KT is actually like, feels like a much bigger threat than it than it even normally does because it can affect so much more relevant portions of the map at one time and also it's very slow travel speed is significantly ameliorated because the map's so small so that advantage is not as pronounced Panzer IV getting spanked about by a lot of Zisk guns here has to be careful T-34 comes in for the ramp and the IL-2 rocket barrage claiming its second Panzer IV of the match epic stuff nicely done T-34 engine gone on that one going to be trying to limp away where is this King Tiger whoa it's kind of overrunning here getting a little bit greedy SU-85 now on the field looking for shots into the KT kind of trying to find some needs to position itself around about here so that it can traverse along this line you're not going to find hits through here I don't think but he's trying for it Zisk gun gets taken out chaos going on on the western flank T-34 final touches come down looks like the uh, Stuka close air support coming in on that one so it looks like a lot of tank busting aircraft finding their mark in this game nice stuff to see very cinematic additional Falsham Jaegers committing to the field oh sorry this is the reinforcing thing that the uh, close air support lets you do of course um, so okay SU-85 in a slightly exposed position here I would love it if you would just put it here it's much more powerful here ah this is not a very good place for it but anyway this gun going to get salvaged by Volks Grenadiers. This SU-85 has not, is not finding hits through these sandbags. Nope. Um, so, okay, yeah, KT going to be getting repaired here, but... Trading the Panzer IV for the T-34 at this stage in the game is probably fine. And as with Tora, if you just had a button, if you could just be like, yes, I choose to trade, and both of those units explode if you just press the button. I think he would press that button. Now he finds himself in a late game scenario where he is the underdog, the scoreline he is trailing, but he has an okay unit composition, he has an SU-85, and if he's able to just take back like two of these victory points, I feel like this is going to be relatively difficult for the Axis player to push into. Um, it all depends how these fights come with the SU-85 versus the armoured targets that the Axis player presents. If he can start getting some veterancy onto that SU-85 quickly, and if he can like take back some areas of the map that are relevant, he should be fine. But if the KT is able to just sit around here and police these two victory points, I think that's going to be a really bad time. 
for the Axis player. Also, I mean, Soviet forces have not been over here in this area of the map for a long time. So I would love to see Quatora try and do something about that. Try and just task an allied unit, some infantry. We're going out there and just make the Axis player have to commit some forces to holding that BP. Don't, don't let him have it for free. I appreciate that the situation feels dire and you feel like you need all hands on deck here, but I still think it's a valuable choice to send some infantry out onto the far right victory point there. Okay, so Panzer II here, going to be supporting some infantry. This Dansack has been so useful. Just gets all of the core infantry to have to fall back here. T-70 chipping in for additional damage with Tora here. Just actually able to do what I said, he takes back the two VPs. And now where's the SU-85? Where is it? Where is it positioned? Nah, I don't like this position again. Ah, uh, this is okay, I suppose. Look, because each because SU-85s don't have a turret, right? The reason I'm being so critical, SU-85s don't have a turret, which means that you have the positioning is even more important than it is with a regular vehicle. You have to think of it ahead of time, and you have to think what is the line that I want to be traversing backwards and forwards with this SU-85? What's the safest, most advantageous line that I can position? Like, imagine it's on rails. Where am I going to build the tracks for this unit to be moving along? You know, and. This is quite far forwards, and now look, when he turns, it exposes it. It's so close to the front. A better position is here, because that way it can move to here, it can move to here, or it can rotate and move to here much more safely. I mean, it's small things, but sometimes you see SU-85 die, SU-85s die due to these decisions. So, you know, I'm here, I'm a caster, I'm going to be critical. That's what I'm doing. Okay, SU-85 moving in here. It's going to be able to find some shots on this, t on this King Tiger. Nice. Gets a penetrating hit. Watching the veterans here is what we want to see spiking up for this SU-85 if Batora is going to have a chance in this game. And already, the triple Zis gun SU-85, this is not a King Tiger that gets to that gets to do what it wants. This is a King Tiger that's actually being forced back right now. Now, that's okay because PFC is still finding value on the map. Volks Grenadiers, crucially, able to claim back middle VP. So there's still a win for PFC. But the fact that we're in a late game at 35 minutes in with a scoreline that is merely dominating for the Axis player rather than over and with a with a composition for the allied player where he feels able to pu push a King Tiger around a little bit given how we saw the early game go this is kind of like best case scenario this is like I feel like we're in the highest percentage odds for how this game could have gone for Watora and that a testament to his skill decision making through all of these horrible fights we saw him take in like the late early game and through the mid game stages like, he was taking fights against a horrible Axis opponent with a vastly superior in terms of tech army. Um, and somehow he was still able to deflect and, like, not lose the game. Um, so here we go. Okay, Conscript's going to push forward and try and take back middle VP here as well they need to. Uh, a T-34 has been refreshed into the roster here. So we have a Soviet medium on the field. Uh, honestly, not sure what I think about this T-34. I don't know. I just don't know. I I trust Batora's decision making here. And so far as I feel like he's so far behind in this game, he can't. I mean, the trouble is he's already got like the extra fuel, right? You can build two SU-85s. You can do it. It's horrible for Axis opponents to do it. If your Axis opponent has committed this much resources and unit cap into a King Tiger and you get two SU-85s, it feels pretty bad. He's getting a panther. Christ. Ugh. I didn't think he'd be able to squeeze a panther into this composition, but he totally can, and he is. Um, I don't know. I feel like the panther's probably game over. That's just very hard to deal with. It's going to make this T-34... Now, now that I know it's a panther being fitted into the roster here for the Axis player, this T-34 feels very wrong. Uh, the shelf life of this T-34 is going to come to a sharp expiry date um, when the panther hits the field. And an SU-85 is just a more textured and more nuanced threat. You know, there's a lot more room for interaction when you have two SU-85s compared to just buying this T-34. So I feel like I don't really like the T-34 anymore. Yeah, I didn't think that PFC would be able to spend his fuel on a, on a sec on another armored choice, but and certainly not a Panther. But now that we've got Panther KT late game, I mean, what can you do against such reckless Axis endgame armor? We're gonna have to find out. <clears throat> what the? Okay, you can get some engineers over here into East. Nicely done. You can take back mid and establish a triple cap and make your Axis opponent have to commit their units and then respond using your anti-tank resources, which is a completely different dynamic than you having to commit your units first and then your opponent getting to cherry pick where they deploy their units. So, 
okay, all right. The first stages here for Watora to be able to take a nice engagement are being set up here. He forces the Axis player to commit his tank resources. This enables the counter deployment by the um, by the allied anti-tank resources. Panther coming in on the flank. Whoa, Panther coming in on the flank here. Gets deflected. Looks like some conscripts going down there, I believe. Uh, KT just going to plant itself firmly on mid. SU-85 in its flank, though. Finding value. Gets his first star of veterancy. Some some damage on that unit. Stuck a close air support, actually mullering the SU-85. Oh, that might be game over for the SU-85. Yeah. Oh, no, that's horrendous. Wow. Stuck a close air support is quite good, isn't it? And now the KT is angling in for the final, the KO blow on this stricken... Oh, no, he's in targeting mode. You need to turn off targeting mode. Look how slow this is. Ah, he hasn't put away the spotter. Oh, no, this SU-85 desperately needs to go into fast movement mode. You don't even have a gun. Oh, no. Oh, this is a really unfortunate engagement here for the Allied player who's getting taken to pieces here. The King Tiger able to just plow for value. Uh... Desperate MG34 here, able to turn back these Falschermigas. Somehow the SU-85 survives. How, I don't really know. Conscripts in the hood here. Are there any Zis guns left standing? There is one, but it's getting hounded by a Panther. The T-34 will get destroyed. Panther's quite good at that. And, I mean... He's going to immediately rebuy the T-34, which I disagree with. But, I mean, it's desperate times right now. Panther's going to overrun, wants to find the SU-85. Will do just that. And Watora here put together a heroic game, but that's game. You can't lose the SU-85. So, wow, nicely a nice game, well attempted. I'm just gonna wait for the GG. Is he not GGing? Mate, you're dead. I hate to tell you this, bro. You ain't gonna win this one. The mines finally find a panther. But there's, there's, there's nothing here to take advantage. There are no, I mean, there's no anti-tank resources left on the roster. That's why you know it's game. Hey, the five-star Kubelwagen finally goes down. Heroic Danzac there. T70 versus King Tiger Panther. We're not sure how this one turns out, but I think I have a good idea. That is a brave-ass T70. Damn, son. All right, he has a T-34. If this T-34 can beat both of these Axis tanks, then we've got a game again, but I just don't know that it can. Ziskun finding additional hits on this exposed Panther, though. T-34 might be interested in some of this action, but what's this? What's this? What's this ability? Oh, smoke pots. Well, that's not going to be enough. All right, T-34 gets eyes on the Panther, comes in, wants a piece. Not going to find it, though. Desperate last attempt here by Vatora. No, 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 no. We're not going to do it wasting shells on a King Tiger. Ugh. Alright. Alright. So that's game, right? That, that's, that's game, right? Conscript's going to just walk up to this King Tiger uh, to throw down the IL 2 rockets? Finding some good damage. Really scary. That's going to keep the KT off the line for a bit longer. But, I mean, we've got three-star Storm Pioneers. They just repair vehicles so fast. Um, so, I mean, a, a valiant rocket barrage there. But it really needed to try and find a wounded Panther rather than go after the KT. T-70 going to come in here and attempt to get the KO blow on a, uh, a Panzer II who is quite badly wounded. Uh, I think an anti-vehicle grenade con connecting off of these conscripts there. So T-70 is actually going to get the better end of this engage, it seems. Uh, Falschermig is just very damaging, though. Going to come through here. Manages to reman a couple of the... Well, one of the Zisk guns and uh, building another. So Watora actually feels like he can somehow still salvage something in this game, which maybe... Um, I don't know, man. He needs to repair the T-34. And he's just... He just doesn't have the time. T70 here finding a heroic penetrating hit on that uh, <laughs> on that Panther. Not that it makes much difference. T34 here is will be forfeit. There ain't no way you survive from this. Donk, there we go. And uh, engine damage on this Panther. It is in the arc of a Zis gun, which is not deployed right now. What is this Zis gun doing? Probably kill the Panther, mate. That's what I do. Or try to. It's not really getting to be able to do that. Where's the other Zis gun? All right, coming into position. 
What is this panther doing? All right, he's getting some more hits on it. Gets the T70. The enemy has destroyed one of our vehicles. And I mean, he's probably still going to be able to get out with this panther. Falsham Jaeger's going to come sledgehammering through here, looking for kills on the Zis guns, and finally the KT is repaired, so it's going to show up here in a big way. Gets one of the Zis guns. And this, for sure, has to be the curtain call for Watora. Sir, you have lost this game. I hate to tell you, because you fought very valiantly, but... There can be no victory against such a reckless Axis. Desperately recurring this this guns to try and put something together here. A Panzer IV is getting added in? Bro. It's pretty gross. Yikes. I mean, somehow he forces this Axis armor back. It doesn't actually break. And he still holds a VP. I mean, this game's totes over, but I'm just saying, you know, Watora... This has been a, a game where Watora has never felt like he's going to win, but he has always felt like he's taking good fights and playing like a hero. And that I totally respect, you know, actually. Sometimes, and I maintain this, sometimes RTS is not about trying to win. It's about seeing how long you can stay in the game, seeing how badly you can inconvenience your opponent, seeing how much you can make your opponent work to take the win off you, you know? Sometimes you ain't going to be able to win. But it is still a valid exercise to see how well you can lose. You can still learn a lot about the game, you can still develop your skills. As long as you are okay knowing that you are fighting for a lost cause, oh no, he's going to lose these conscripts. As long as you are okay knowing that you're fighting for a, fighting for a lost cause, um, you know, that you can still learn, you can still... This is not a profitless exercise for Matora. And I respect that. I respect that. And also, we've all got a couple of stories, we've all got a couple of replays saved from those games where we were like, yeah, this game was over and I was fighting from the underdog position and it was super, super, super duper over and I was just playing to see how long I could stay in the game and then somehow managed to win because your opponent like threw the game in some horrendous way or something. Like, we've all got those stories, we've all got those replays. Here comes the T-34, by the way. I'm gonna come on in here. Panzer II gets dominated, probably the most expendable unit in the roster for the PFC, so he's super okay with that. Uh, Watora here, still trying to desperately put together a functional Soviet army. Uh, has two Zis guns somehow. Uh, has a T-34. Has like one unit of conscripts as core infantry here. Still actually not on the clock somehow. Um, now we've got Panzer IV, KT, Panther. It's pretty intimidating. Those are some very scary tanks to deal with, to be honest. Where is the KT? Oh, here it is. How does he not have the right camo for this KT? This, the camo on the mediums is lovely, but this KT looks a little out of place here. Somehow gonna grab mid. Is Watora. Not quite sure how he's still alive. You are showing weakness. We are down to 75 points. I mean, weakness is one word for it. I think he's, just, he's showing like immense defense with a completely inferior resources against a ridiculous Axis late game army. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said before, I, I respect Watora for the show of defiance, which we're now chronicling here. Donk. Goes for it with the T-34. Probably a bit premature, but you know what else. IL-2 rocket's gonna come on in for massive damage. Conscripts desperately chipping in with their little anti-vehicle grenades, but the Zis guns are nowhere nearby, and without those, we can't really put together a kill here. A four-star light gun. Rare game you get to see that. T-34 gonna get traded out here. The last vestiges of Soviet resistance getting utterly crushed. KT gonna park itself in the base, and that's when you know things are over. Um, so, wow. I, you know what? I'm really glad we caught this game. Yeah, it was one-sided the whole way through. I don't I don't really feel like Watora ever legitimately had a ray of hope in this game. But he fought very well and he displayed some real cunning and some real grit, taking a lot of a lot of fights as the underdog against a ridiculously advantaged um OKW opponent and even for a couple of moments here and there making me doubt myself. Um 
and generally speaking, despite getting off to a horrendous start in this game, I think some of Otora's choices in so far as composition, positioning, and just the way he was able to take those fights, I might have to go back and have a look at that because there were a couple of fights in that game where I'm just like, I'm sorry, how is the Axis player having to fall back here? And I feel like I need a second look at that because Vatora put together some, some magic there. Um, so... No, the game wasn't close, but yes, I'm still very glad I cast it, because like I say, Watora here in this game, able to put together some magic. But uh, congratulations where they're due, PFC, uh, operating a well-oiled and ridiculously powerful Axis crushing machine here, and uh, navigating that machine to a well-earned win. So um, yeah, um, <laughs> an interesting day of games today. I'll be looking to cast a couple more sessions as the week goes on. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully we're going to find some, uh, some more... Some more... I don't know, how can I put this? Close games as the week goes on. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for watching. And this for now, Magpie842 signing out.